All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter number three. Uh, we are uh, not, don't have to be in a rush today because the Cowboys 49er game is actually a nighttime game. So I say, man, amen. So we don't have to, you know, speed up the preaching time. Praise God. We can just obliviate for hours. Amen. And know that we will be on time for our next appointment. Uh, but have no fear. Uh, I think I preached a good hour of my time away last night at the Paramount. I ain't been out late that long in a long time. I mean, I, it's just a trip how you get old real fast, you know. Uh, you just be sitting there like, okay, man, it's, it's late. I'm yawning and stuff and sitting on the front row and it's loud and bright and you still yawning and tired. Thank everyone who wished me a happy birthday last week and sent your uh, well wishes on Facebook, Instagram, and, and in person and cars. Just thank y'all. Y'all made 48-year-old uh, brother Phil uh, 47. Praise God. No. <laughs> no, we are so thankful and grateful for your generosity and your love. And I hope that uh, we continue to uh, take care and love on one another while we have the ability to do so. Uh, life is so indeed short, and we ought to cherish one another while we are here. The book of Philippians <clears throat> is Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Philippi was a major colony of Rome. So again, uh, just continuing to imagine that there has never been a time when the word of God has not been uh, attempting to make, be made sense of by people who are living under the occupation, the brutality, and the hegemony of human systems, governments, and structures. That God is always trying to remind us that God's original intent is not for us to dominate one another, but for us to live in harmony with one another. And in those times where we fall short as a country, as a people, as creation, to live in harmony with one another, I want you to know that the word of God, the works of God, uh, are always being given and extended to us as God's people in these circumstances and contexts to remind us that we are not forsaken by God even when we are living in places, situations, and contexts where we are constantly bombarded by the external forces of evil, violence, wickedness, or human frailty. And I want us to be a people who are always reminding ourselves that we are not forsaken. You are not forsaken. That no matter where you are in your journey, God has not stopped speaking life to you. God has not stopped whispering, and dare I say even sometimes shouting, to remind you that there is better. There is more. There is a pathway forward. And so that is what we're going to be preaching a little bit about today out of the book of Philippians. We're going to kind of sit in a text that is offering all of us a message, a consistent message about the need to press forward. And that'll be the title of our message, just press forward. But Philippians chapter number three, verse one, we're going to read a little bit all through uh, the next 15 verses. It's a lot of verses, but, and I'm only going to preach for three or four of them, but it was all such good stuff in here. I said, man, I bet you they just want to hear this. So uh, get ready to hear some good stuff. Have you ever read the scripture, the sacred text, and it just spoke to you without anybody else having to say a word? Mm-hmm. That's why some of us, we should read our scriptures more frequently because the word of God is alive. It is dynamic. It often can sow a seed in your heart without you having to need Pastor Mike, Pastor Tanisha, your prayer partner or life group leader to even say a word. Sometimes God's word is the best thing you need to hear at the right moment and you don't always know when it is. Uh, C.S. Lewis calls it a divine surprise. And so, you know, in between reading your propaganda on the Twitter feed and your likes on Instagram and the gossip on uh, everything. 
Pick up the word of God every day and let it speak to you. The scriptures say these words, Philippians chapter number three. Uh, I'll start at verse number three. And that's about it, friends. Be glad in God. Mm-hmm. That's good all by itself. At least that was good to me because I've been a little upset all week. Be glad in God. I don't mind repeating what I have written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. It's better to safe than sorry, so here it goes. Steer clear of the barking dogs, those religious busybodies who are all bark and no bite. All they're interested in is appearances, Knife happy circumcisers, I call them. Now, let me just give you a little context because this may feel like, man, Paul don't like dogs. He don't like knives. He don't like circumcision. What is going on? So it's, it's just important to appreciate that Paul is literally writing this letter to Christians, people who have identified themselves as followers of the way of Jesus, and they are in a conflict, a theological argument about who gets to be counted as a, a legitimate follower of Jesus. Now, it's a fascinating thing that people have for thousands of years been trying to put a litmus test on who is a follower of Jesus. What do you think about this? It seems to me that if you follow Jesus, it ought to just kind of be up to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Yeah. Not up to you and me. It's like, oh, you ain't no follower of Jesus. Like, yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I know. It's like, wait a second. Can, I, can Jesus weigh in on this, please? <laughs> but when we create a litmus test, then the litmus test is usually based on our preferences and not Jesus's preferences. Now, it's not to suggest that there is no kind of uni, uh, unifying kind of sensibility or some fruit that ought to come from the tree of our lives that we can all look at and identify. But here in this text, you had some folks who were Jewish. Uh, literally, they were a part of the nation of Israel that came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Ruth, and, and all these different folks. And, and for thousands of years, they have been identifying themselves through circumcision. And all of us know what circumcision is. It is a surgery done uh, on a male babies to, 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 you know, identify them. Somebody say amen. And, and, and so for, for, for thousands of years, this was the litmus test for what and how you identified as a Jew. And these new followers who were Gentiles, older people, particularly men, were being asked by the Jewish folk that if you're going to follow Jesus, you got to get circumcised. And uh, I think the fellows was like, mm, I want to follow Jesus, but not that bad. Somebody say, man, because this, this, you know, I don't remember any of that stuff when I was a baby, but I'm 40 something years old and I'll walk around here. Amen. Discomfort, uncomfortable. And I don't think Jesus asked me to do that. And they were right. But they created a litmus test and caused all this kerfuffle around their inability to measure up to their litmus test. And so Paul, who is a Jew, but who is literally reaching out now to non-Jews, they are called Gentiles, and most of us, without knowing your you know, deep, intricate racial and, and ethnic identity, most of us would be part of that crowd in the in the company of Gentiles, Paul is saying, don't worry about those kind of people. As a matter of fact, he says, stay clear of the barking dogs, religious busybodies, who are always interested in appearances, knife-happy circumcisers. So now you understand what Paul's talking about when he says a knife-happy circumciser. Paul says, stay, stay away from those. And I'll just offer to you today... For some of us who find it hard to always get approval and affirmation from some so-called followers of Jesus, you don't got to argue with those folks. You can tell them, the Bible tells me to stay clear of you. <laughs> Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, the Bible says I can stay clear. 
spirit of you knife happy circumcisers. You know, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to rant too much longer, but, you know, sometimes it'd be really dope rather than cussing people out, you just use like the biblical language on them. So n when somebody get on your nerves, call them a knife happy circumciser. Just let them sit with that. I'm just calling you what the Bible calls you. All right. The real believers, we're going to keep reading, Paul says, are the ones, listen, that the Spirit of God leads to work away at this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do it. Paul's saying it's not, it's not about circumcision. The real followers of Jesus are the ones who every day are waking up to fill the air with the praises, the truth, the love, the peace, the joy of Christ, of God in the world. Paul is redefining for the folks in Philippi what it means to be a part of this great body. And he keeps on saying, we couldn't carry this off by our own efforts, and we know it, even though we can list what many might think are impressive credentials. So Paul now gets ready to list his resume, because Paul, writing this letter, is also writing to a group of people who were actually being told that they are not listening to Paul, because Paul is upsetting the status quo. So Paul says, okay, they say that they are like the cream of the crop. They're the best theologians. They're the best preachers. They're the best pastors. They got all these ethnic, religious, cultural uh, 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 badges of honor. Paul says this, you know my pedigree. Paul said, let me pop my collar for a second. All you haters out there think I just got here. Paul says, I'm a legitimate birth, which means he said, I am a Jew. Circumcised on the eighth day. I'm an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin. Paul says, I ain't one of them, you know, them lesser tribes. I'm going to say another word, but I'm, I'm trying to not be too inflammatory today. He says, I am a strict and devout adherent to God's law. I'm a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church. Paul said, everything that you're claiming to be, I'm that and more. A meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special. I'm tearing them up and throwing them out with the trash. Woo. How many of you ever, you know, been in an interview and, and you going through your resume and then you, but you know what? Man, forget this resume. You start tearing it up. You ain't got to be worrying about this resume because the real prize is me. So Paul is saying, forget all these descriptions and these accolades. He's saying, I'm throwing all of that out in the trash along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want a petty, inferior brand of righteousness, Paul continues to say. That comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind of righteousness that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally experience Christ's resurrection, be a partner in Christ's suffering, and go all the way, somebody say all the way, all the way with Christ to death itself if there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead. Paul is saying, everything that I laid out in my resume, I'm willing to give all of it away if I could just tap into the knowledge that comes from knowing and being proximal to the God who's able to take death and defeat it and raise me from the dead. Basically, Paul is saying, everything I learned, everything I've been, every experience I've had, I'm willing to trade it all in if I could just access the power of God that was able to raise dead people to life. Why? Paul said, because everything I learned, I ain't learned that yet. How I many of you can be honest about it? everything I've learned in life? There's some things I have not learned yet that I know only God can reveal and show me. Hello, somebody, right? 
So Paul is, is, is kind of telling him, listen, all the things that you've gotten, all the things that you value, all the things that you, you spend your whole life working towards, be willing to bundle it all up and put it over here in the corner because God's trying to show you something else through the pressing of getting to know him. I gave up all that inferior stuff. Verse number 10, I believe we're in, because this is all so good, or did I skip down? What, where, where, where I'm at? Oh, no, I'm still, I'm still up here. Uh, uh, uh-huh. uh, I gave all that inferior stuff up so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection of the dead, I wanted to do it. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand. Everything I once thought, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. It is like dog dung. I've dumped it all in the trash so I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want, oh, man, am I reading things over again, Lord Jesus? Okay, so then I'll go down to verse number 12. Uh, So I'm not saying, no, let me go back up to verse number 11. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have made it, but I am well on my way. Pat yourself on the chest, say, I'm on my way. Come on, say that, I'm on my way. I'm reaching out for Christ, who has so wonderfully reached out for me. That is a powerful sense. I'm reaching out for Christ. Who has first reached out for me? There was a song we sing in the church that says, Oh, how I love Jesus because he first. Our response to God is literally a response to God's initiation in our lives. Man, I I sat with that for a moment. Don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back, so let's keep focused on that goal, those of us who want everything God has for us. If any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk for the next few minutes just from the topic press. Press, press, press. And if you want to add a word, you can say forward. Bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And Lord, let the preaching and teaching be made easy through the power of your spirit, that it may bless us even as we hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all the people of the way say amen. The, the, the best uh, most familiar translation of this passage says that I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. You haven't ever heard that before. You've been in church a little while. Not everybody, not a lot of folks. That's okay. So this is one of the most kind of widely quoted scriptures in church. People always are conscious and cognizant that our journey above all else with Christ is not always about the destination as much as it is about the process. That spiritual development, our development after the ways of God, as we walk through, live through, uh, endure human relationships and the created world, 
we are always being called into a deeper sense of pressing. That it is the press, it is the journey, it is the process that transforms you from who you are today to who you will be tomorrow. And I want you to know, beloved, who you are today. Look at your hands. Look at your hands. Everybody look at your hands. This is not your final state. There's a better you coming. There's a more improved life coming. That who you are today is not the final destination. Mm -hmm. But, but, But there is a press that is often required to get from who you are today to who you will be. The scripture says in another verse that when Jesus appears, we will all be like him. Now, quiet as it's kept, I am not like Jesus just yet. I I got a lot of ways. Too little, too quick-tempered. A little too sharp-mouthed. I was at Notre Dame speaking on this panel with some elders and some, they turned to be very religious, social, political, conservative, black preacher elders. And they were on a panel talking about Black Lives Matter. And of course they was all men, and they 60, 70 year old, and they just began to tell lies at the Notre Dame. And I'm sitting there, And I am doing all that I can to not disrespect my elders. So I didn't do anything but just said, that's a lie. (laughs) That's all I said. I may have said it three or four times to dispute every lie that they told. And so afterwards, you know, uh, you know, I, I won the argument, of course, because it, it was a lie. You know, Black Lives Matter, they out here burning down their community. That's a lie. I was, I, I mean, some people say I'm part of Black Lives Matter. I ain't burned down nothing yet, praise God. So, you know, we hold out hope for that if that's what you want Black Lives Matter to be. But that's not what it was. Black Lives Matter, they, they are communists. No, 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 no. I know a lot of Black Lives Matter people, and they are capitalists to a core. So, so that's a lie, too. You're just lying. Now, 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 part of what happened in this conversation, just telling you how I'm not like Jesus yet. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Is that, you know, afterwards, you know, I, I went over, and we had lunch with the elders, and I was trying to educate them away from the panel of 100-some people in Notre Dame. And we ended up in a good place. And then the, the, the organizers who brought me there, they were like, Wow, Pastor Mike, y'all's panel was the most liveliest panel of the whole two days. I said, really? I said, yes. He said, as soon as you called them a lie, <laughs> we felt the temperature just go up in the room. And, you know, I sat there to reflect. I mean, I don't know that I regret calling them a lie, but I just sat there and reflected. I said to myself, you know, I got a long way to be like Jesus. Amen. Because, you know, maybe the way I said they was a lie is what messed things up. Maybe I could have said, the truth is not in you. You are fibbing. You are highly misinformed. But the sharp tongue nature of Michael McBride in this journey of my life made a morally right position perhaps become an inflammatory place of division. Have you ever been in a situation where you know, man, I got to be more like Jesus? Not because I'm just going to be turning the other cheek. You can just knock me upside the head and get dizzy, getting concussions. No, no, I'm not talking about that. No, no, no. Uh, my, 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 my friend, I was in Pretoria, South Africa at a conference, and he said, I got the theology of the third slap. I said, I must learn more. <laughs> He said, <laughs> Lord, I, what am I talking about today? I, I'll tell you this thing. I don't, I'm not telling you to use it. But he said, Jesus said to turn, if they slap you on one cheek, to turn the other cheek. But he didn't say what to do on the third slap. <laughs> I 
said, I can resonate with that, praise God. It's just called constructive theology. You know about that, Doc, constructive theology, amen. But there are times when your constructive theology, you can be honest and say, this is not like Jesus. It may make me feel good culturally. It may make me feel good politically. It may make me feel good even in my positionality. But there are some moments in my life where I got to be more like Jesus. And pressing in to the process of this transformation is what I think the text is inviting us to do. And so the first thing that I want you to believe and to understand is that when we press forward, it is largely informed by our goals. So my first thought to you today comes out of verse number 14. I press on for the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What are your goals? Now, again, we got three more months left roughly in this year. Every year, uh, we all have goals. We all have New Year's resolutions. We have all these, these promises, these things we're going to do. How many have done the, the vision boarding? Somebody say amen, right? Some of y'all be at retreats. Y'all do a retreat every quarter. <laughs> You're trying to get your goals together. Mm-hmm. But the question I have about your goals is do the goals you have actually serve as a way to form you into a better person? Your goal should not just be an achievement. Your goal should be something that makes you a better person. It is like when you are trying to accomplish a a physical workout, the, the, the kind of exercises you engage in isn't just to make you sweat, but they're supposed to make parts of your body turn out a certain way, strengthen some muscles, activate some atrophied organs and the things that, that, you know, I, 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 I can't remember, Anthony told me when he used to work me out that your body has, oh, okay, I can't remember if I'm talking about the Torah or the body, but it was the Torah. There's 10 commandments, but 611 amendments in the Torah. And I think it was a similar number in your body. Like your body got so many muscles and ligaments we don't even use. And so there's an exercise that can get a part of your body activated and you'll be sore. You'll be sore. You don't ever work out and you're just running, (laughs) giggling. Oh, this is is great. (laughs) And you don't feel nothing. Matter of fact, you feel good afterwards. Oh, man, Man, this is great. And then you wake up the next morning and you hurting in places. You didn't know there was pain receptors there. Why? Because you started to work on muscles that you didn't know existed. Well, your goals, our goals need to be that particular. You ought to have goals. We ought to have goals that literally activate multiple parts of our character. Of our mind. Body for show. Heart, spirit. But if your goals are me-sized, meaning I just want to keep strengthening the parts of me that I like. You know, my sharp tongue. Oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I need to strengthen that. I need to work that muscle. Sometimes our goals are me-sized. They're not God-sized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When was the last time you had a God-sized goal? Lord, have mercy. I'm talking about a goal that as you work towards it, it's doubling back to work on you. Oh, I'm working to be a black capitalist. Well, I'll tell you what that goal is going to do. It's probably going to make you more selfish. Probably make you more individualistic. Probably going to make you more prone to, you know, being okay with violence and and stratification. Because, you know, they didn't work as hard as me. I woke up at six in the morning. I only went off for of four hours of sleep. On and on and on and on. And I told, I had so many crazy conversations 
I had a rich person tell me, you know, you can't be mad at the billionaire, Pastor Mike, because nobody works as hard as them. I said, really? I said, I've known black women my whole life. Ooh, they wake up before I wake up and they go to bed after I go to bed. And they working. And they ain't no billionaire. So it ain't about work. But when you got an ideology and a goal that is about those outcomes, guess what it's going to do to you? It's going to form you into something that is not holy. A God-sized goal means that even if I'm working in a school, if I'm working on a job, if I'm playing the music, if I'm doing comedy, if I'm a lawyer, if I'm a garbage worker, those God-sized goals inside my vocation are turning me into something that is holy. And that's my prayer. God, give me a God-sized goal. I don't want a goal that's just about me. I'm not all that. I'm too small to spend my whole life only working on me. When God is living inside of me and God is saying, I want you to literally work on the world. Palestine needs your goals. Israel needs your goals. Somalia needs your goals. East Oakland needs your goals. Hunter's Point needs your goal. You worrying about the goal inside of you and God is saying, I got a God size goal. But the God size goal can only be accomplished through the God who's forming you. And that's why I love, oh, let me give you a reflection question. Are your goals God size or are they me sized? Is the God goal something that can benefit not just you and those you like? Do they manifest? Everybody likes to talk about manifesting now. Manifesting. Manifesting joy. Peace. Is, is your God size goal manifesting some joy and some peace? Or is it just making you better? No, child of God. Now listen, this is what I believe the followers of Jesus, we got to own this. I can't talk to nobody else because I don't really know their religion like that. But I know what following Jesus is supposed to produce. It's not supposed to produce violent people, abusive people, people who have a, 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 a Dracula vampiric lust for blood. How, how, how can you follow Jesus and be wanting to see other people die? Murdered, raped, robbed. But I follow, I've decided to follow. No, no, no. I don't know who you follow. That's not Jesus. So guess what? Your God-sized goal has to manifest healing, peace, justice, love, and knowledge of God. And they require you to press into it. And let me tell you this, I move on. But the more you press into a God-sized goal, the more the, the work of that goal begins to press into you. It is a mutuality. It is a symbiosis. It is God, I'm doing God-sized goals and you are in return working on me. You're making me a more loving, forgiving, hopeful, peaceful person. Why? Because I'm pursuing love, hope, and peace in you. And I know all of us, we we got these self-help, I want to be better, I want to be better, but I just want you to know, beloved, if your goals aren't producing peace, love, and joy in the world. It is turning you into the opposite of that. You can't work your whole life on a goal (laughs) that is the opposite of what you want to become and then be surprised that you become that. I got to get off this point because, you know, it's messing me up even while I'm talking. I'm just... God, give me a God-sized goal that can heal my body and stabilize my mind and redeem my spirit. God-sized goal. The second thing that the scripture tells us that we got to be willing to persevere. Somebody holler persevere. There's a blessing in the press. Anybody ever heard that in a little church colloquial? There's a blessing in the press. You know, church, we always have nice little rhymes. 
Mm -hmm. Little, 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 just little snippets. Hey, Amen. There's a blessing in your present. You ought to just tell your neighbor, there's a blessing in your present. You shake the hand, there's a blessing in your present. Again, this week, you ought to walk around all week. There's a blessing in my pressing. I'm going to keep pressing forward. Why? Because when I persevere, I begin to drop things off so I can pick some things up. How many of you are willing, listen, to, to increase your focus and perseverance on your God-sized goal? And along the way, you got to be willing to lose some things so you can gain some things. You got to be willing. While I'm on this journey, while I'm persevering, I can't persevere the way I need to because this thing's too heavy, so I'm going to drop it off. I'm going to drop them off. I'm not going to throw you down and stomp on you. I'm just going to, you know, let you go. It's been nice. But I'm pressing on the upward yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. New heights I'm gaining yes, every day. Yes, Still on, I'm upward bound. It's good that what Tom says, Lord, plant my feet on higher. You can be solid too. <laughs> but higher ground. What's the gift about being on higher ground? When you're on higher ground, you can see things a little bit more clearly. When you're on higher ground, you can see the hole from your particular location. When you're on higher ground, you're able to literally figure out where your destination lies. And the persevering is the hardest part of the pressing. Why? Because when you persevere, not only you got to be willing to lose some things in order to gain some things, this is the hardest part. You got to be willing to forget what you Learned. So you can be open to what you need to know. Yes. Some of our space, we call that decolon decolonizing your mind. Nice, sophisticated way of saying some things you learned, they don't serve you well anymore. Some things you learned that were absolutely true, they were not absolutely true. They were like circumcision. Knife, what, what, do, you, what, what do you call them? Knife happy circumcisers. What are the knife happy circumcising ways that you done internalized? That you got to be willing through your perseverance. I got to let some of this stuff go. Could have been something you learned from a person, a place, or a thing. Something you learned at church. Something you learned in your family. And you realize, hmm, the more I press into my relationship with God, the more I get aligned with creation, the more I become more peaceful and humble, I got to learn, unlearn some things that I thought were true. Give you an example. We learned in a, in a neighborhood that if somebody hits you, you better hit them back harder. That's what we learned. <laughs> some of us spend our whole life living that out. But the problem is when you hit flesh too hard with anything, Flesh dies. And when flesh dies, guess what? A part of you dies. And the more you harm flesh, the more you harm yourself. And so while you're hitting back at something hard, you are actually causing a double trauma to yourself. You may kill a thing, but you walk around a dead person. And many of us have learned to respond to trauma with more trauma. And now we're trying to figure out how come I can't, how can I get triggered all the time? Well, it's because you got to unlearn some things. But how many know it's hard to unlearn some things if you ain't got nothing to replace of it? Mm-hmm. How many of us, be honest, say, I need this habit because if it gets taken away, I don't know what I'm going to do without this habit. It could be, you know, 10 cups of coffee before you go to work. <laughs> it could be, you know, on Instagram, from the sun up to the sundown, TikTok, likes, soap operas, puff puff passing, here, there, everywhere, up, down, side to side, self-medicating habits. Why? Because to unlearn that habit, means you often leave a gaping hole. And I hear God saying to some of us today, there are some practices and some things that we must engage. Why? So we can lose some things in order to gain some things. I do believe, beloved, that there are some things that we must gain. But 
they come when you are willing to lay some things down. I got one more point, but I'm going to end there because I feel led to end there. That there's a pressing, a pressing into knowledge of God, perseverance, hope. There's a pressing that we are being invited into as God's people if we are going to literally be transformed into the image and the likeness of God. Paul says, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection. I want to share with him in his sufferings. And I even, I'm willing to be like him into death so I can have access to the resurrection of the dead. The way we get access to resurrecting power is to be willing to persevere through the process of knowing the ways of Christ in a way, not so you can come to church and become some uber-religious, spiritual, flame-throwing, demon-slaying, tongue-talking, water-walking. No, no, no. I believe that if we get in tune and in line with God, can you imagine if your life it was so aligned with God that every response to a life circumstance produced peace, healing, hope, liberation, salvation. That's, that's what I think formation after the ways of Jesus ought to do. It ought to create more of God-sized goals in the world. Stay with me, everybody. Mm. My storage is empty, yes, and I am available to you. God, I pray for the person, grab the hand of someone or their elbow, their shoulder. I just want us to touch and agree with a few folks today. That God, I believe that my loved one who I'm touching today, their desire is to press forward. That this place they've been caught in, this cycle of harm, this cycle of trauma, this cycle of the status quo is insufficient for the mutual symbiotic work that you seek to do that is going to turn them into a finished product that they can look in the physical mirror and even in the spiritual mirror and say, I am becoming more like God. So I pray God for whatever obstacles are getting in their way, whatever disbelief, unbelief, doubt, cynicism, inquiry, the disappointments that some of us have with you, God, because our lives continue to be too proximal to pain and sadness and shame and loss. Whatever it is, God, that's getting in the way of my beloved who I'm touching right now, God, I pray that you will even right now begin to penetrate through the hardness, the shell of that particular emotion, that particular feeling, that particular situatedness. I pray, God, that even right now you may reveal yourself as a active, present God who is literally unfolding oneself into their mind, their heart, their spirit in their body. I pray, God, that you'll heal them. Squeeze their hand gently. Say, heal them, Lord. I pray that you'll, Lord God, resurrect them. Squeeze their hand and say, resurrect them, Lord. I pray, God, that you will remind them that you're near them. I pray that you will fill their body and their heart with love and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Do it for them right now, God. Let them know that there's power, that there's hope, there's strength. That is found in you. And we'll say thank you, Lord. 
because we know you're able to do anything but fail. Now lift your hands right where you're standing. It's me, oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. Not my mother, my father. It's not my sister or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need your power. I need your anointing. I need you, God, to help me press. Hallelujah. I need you to help me press forward. I need you to help me press through, God, these hard moments. Lord God, the evil and wickedness in the world. God, it's causing my mind, my sensibilities, oh God, to be dulled. I need to press through it, God, so we can be people who are dynamic, whose nerves are sensitive to your will and your work. God, I need to be pressing forward to the heavenly upward call that is found in you. So God, I pray that you'll start first with me. Make me an instrument of your peace. Make me an instrument of your joy. Make me an instrument of your love. And know, God, that there's something you're doing in me that can't be stopped. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them there's a blessing in your pressing. Come on. My